after a long wait and a lot of back and forth and a lot of hard work on his part and a lot of patience on his part and our part because we're struggling right along with him, uh, he finally heard from his recruiter that he is good to go and he's going to be shipping off to boot camp on July 25th. So that was, that was good news. He's been waiting for that and anticipating it and we're excited for him. And uh, uh, our, our youngest son, Christopher, I got to tell you, he's, uh, he's being a blessing and he is being blessed. He is right now on a mission trip uh, in, at, on an Indian reservation in Wyoming. And uh, we had a talk the other, the other night, and what he was describing to me was um, pretty, how should I say, uh, it's depressing, let's put it that way. It's depressing. When he described the conditions of life on that Indian reservation, He's been to Sri Lanka. Jeremy's been to Sri Lanka. He's been to Nepal. And he's seen poverty. And he said, this is, this is crazy. He is, we're in the United States. And what he, what he saw was just poverty, depression, alcoholism, sexual abuse. He said, there's not a, there's not a one there's not a one, according to the statistics they gave him, there is not a one girl on the Indian reservation that has not been sexually abused. That's my... How many people all told How sad. My gosh. I, I don't know, Pastor, I don't know how big the reservation is, but it, this is really eye-opener. You know, it's like... Whew, Talk about being a blessing. He's there with, a, with his church group to minister and, um, and, and teach and work with the, the youth uh, on the reservation. He's getting a lot of resistance because, you know, basically the Indians see, oh, you're trying to shove white man's religion down our throats. And what he said was that way back when they put the Indians on the reservations, apparently they assigned a Catholic priest to the reservations and this was going to be their religion so you can understand the resistance the reluctance they have and just how um, a whole spirit of darkness has taken over that whole community so we really we need to pray that for that um, but also it, it's kind of a praise report if you will and then that you know the Lord is working through him and uh, we believe he's making some headway and, and sh shedding some light in some of those dark places. So I just want to start with a, a quick word of prayer uh, for our talk tonight. I'm, the pastor is very generous in, in calling this a teaching. I, I, I think of it more as a sharing of observations and a, to give you a perspective on uh, what's out there, what, what France is like in, from a spiritual perspective. So I hope you'll enjoy it. But uh, Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this evening. We thank you for the time that we have uh, together. Uh, I pray, Father, that the words you put in my mouth, the thoughts that you put into my heart and mind, would be good seeds good seeds that are sown into the lives of my brothers and sisters and that they would bear fruit, Father, in whatever, whatever unknown ways you have planned. And we just give you the thanks and praise, the honor and the glory for our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So I kind of wanted to entitle this little talk of mine um, by one simple word, sparks. And you'll understand in a minute why I call it sparks. I want to first start by giving you um, kind of a perspective on Christianity in, in France. We, uh, while we were there, I was there, we were there six weeks, and I was, I was at work while Hélène was out playing and shopping and having fun. And, 
<laughs> having fun with family and so forth. And um, where I worked was a, um, the, 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 the offices were in the headquarters building of a major newspaper in France. And they put out magazines, they put out newspapers, all, all kinds of media. And I picked up one day this issue of, uh, it's called Le Figaro Magazine, as you can see here. And I was kind of flipping through it. And here's this interesting article on um, funny parishioners, is what it's entitled. The funny par parishioners of the United States. And this is kind of a secular perspective on religion in the United States. So here we see, there's a lot of pictures. Here we see there's a, uh, a gentleman, obviously a Christian gentleman, somewhere in California, riding on the beach with a bicycle and, and a cross attached. And you know, the general perspective is they're making jest of all of this, right? And here we have pictures of um, someone with a small chapel, uh, or small, yeah, chapel on the back of their vehicle going down the road. People have in church outdoors. This is the most outrageous one of a, apparently a, a church somewhere in America where people choose to worship in the nude. And they actually have a nude pastor playing the organ. And as you can see in the photo down here, uh, it's not a huge congregation. There's maybe two people in the congregation plus the pastor. And so I, can, I'll, I could go on. Um, and uh, basically, it, you know, if you're interested, you can pick it up later and, and kind of leaf through it. But this is to kind of give you set set the stage, if you will, for how Christianity is, is viewed in France. Uh, we had some very interesting experiences spiritually when we were there. The, um, we arrived on a Saturday, so it was an exhausting uh, trip plus the time difference, so we basically were trying to recover that first weekend. The second Sunday we were there, we started looking for churches. And we went out to a church not far from where we were living, where we stayed. And it was um, a beautiful Protestant church called uh, the Church of uh, the La Pointe, Pointe, La Pointe du Jour, the Point of Daylight, if you will. A beautiful modern church. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say I had some pictures uh, for you tonight to show you, but we couldn't pull them up. So technical issue, but maybe some other time. And so we went to that church, and it was um, it's very interesting. It was a church that was founded by American pastors. And the pastor who was preaching that day was a guest pastor, he was preaching on the topic of prophecy and how all of us can learn to prophesy. And he was, uh, of course, he was preaching. He was, this was a, um, a Baptist preacher, and he was preaching in English, in you know, American English, and being translated into French at the same time. And he ended up, you know, he had some materials to leave behind, and one of the books that I picked up that uh, he made available was called Vous pouvez tous prophétiser, which means you can all prophesy. And so I won't repeat, but maybe sometime we can go over the notes that I took and, and the scripture passages that, that he uh, used um, to back up his, his uh, teaching. But I say that to say that there was a, there was a couple that, we spoke to at the end of the service and we had an interesting conversation. They talked at one point, you all remember the, um, the burning of the cathedral, the French cathedral in Notre Dame in Paris. This, I think it was in, in April, not long before we 
we left, and um, the church burned. I mean, the roof, the entire roof of the cathedral burnt to a crisp and down. It would, this is a church that is 850 years old. 850 years old is when they started building in the 12th century. Okay, so you can imagine how dry the um, the beams, the wooden beams, were. 850 years. Okay, so the thing went up like a match, and it burnt to the ground. I mean, not the church, but the roof just totally caved in. And um, so thinking about this, what, the lady that we were talking to after church, she said, you know, France is very much a bunch of dry wood. It's a bunch of dry wood waiting for a spark. And I thought of that image. I thought of the cathedral burning. And what's left, think of this, what's left is an open cloister, an open sanctuary. The roof has been removed. And now, think of this in spiritual terms. What can happen? What can come down? The Holy Spirit. And what's, that's what we're hoping that's what we're praying for. France is dry, dry, dry. And it has been secular, a secular society for so long. Very much a socialist society. Christianity is shunned. Mocked. Almost on the verge of, I can, we can almost say persecution. Not far from it. And so we believe that France is so dry, it's waiting for a spark. For a spark of the Holy Spirit to just come down. And when that happens, people are going to be so hungry and thirsty for the word of God that it's going to burn up the whole country spiritually, we believe. And there are other things taking place in the country right now that are going to, uh, that are the embers that are going to create that fire that I'll tell you about in, in a minute. <clears throat> so, sparks. Number one was the dry wood. Number two was, think of a white robe. A white robe. This was a blessed moment. We had um, the opportunity to, this is not the first time on this trip, but we've had opportunities in the past to minister and to share our faith with Hélène's sister, Claire. And she has been slowly coming around. The Holy Spirit has been slowly lifting the veil from her eyes. I've known her, we've been married 25 years, and I've known Claire this whole time. Quite honestly, if you were to ask me maybe a year or more ago, I would have said she's probably the, the least likely of the whole family, of Elen's family, to come to the Lord. The least likely. And here she is now. The Holy Spirit is starting to do a work in her heart, and we're starting to see the fruit. We're starting to see the veil being lifted. And at one point, Hélène and I were alone with Claire. And she's very hungry for, to learn more. She wants, she's curious, she's hungry for the word, she wants to know more, she wants to understand things. And... Um, so we prayed with her. We talked about the Holy Spirit. We talked about speaking in tongues. We talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And she was very curious. She wanted to hear what it sounded like. 
So we sat down together, and each of us took turns speaking in tongues while the others listened. And we did that with her twice. Ellen spoke in tongues, I spoke in tongues. And after each time, then we would, we would, uh, we would interpret what we heard was being said in the Spirit. Both times, what we heard was confirmed by the other. And she also heard the same things. And that spoke volumes to her. And um, Claire, um, again, has been seeking. And she has a couple of crosses in her house. She's got one cross on the wall close to the entrance to her house. And she's had experiences before where she's looking at the cross and she feels something coming up inside her. Something trying to get out. And this time, after we had shared the Holy Spirit with her, she went home and she spoke of what happened when she, as soon as she opened the door and saw the cross, she felt the Lord talking to her, speaking to her. She understood his love for her, how he, she was accepted. And she said she felt all of a sudden a white robe being placed over her. She understood her sins were forgiven. And she was now able to wear that white robe. And then what happened? She started speaking in tongues. It was short, but it was certain. And so we're praying with her. We're continuing to pray and minister to her so that more of that will come forth and that she will continue to seek the Lord. She, we, we just recently heard that um, she communicated with Elaine and told her that, yes, I have found the church. She's now going to regularly where they're spirit-filled. They love the Lord. They're Jesus-centered. It's a Bible-believing church. And... Um, so we're excited for that, and we're, you know, we're praising God, and we're thanking the Lord for that. That's another spark. The next thing I want to mention is basically called joy and tears. We had the opportunity, while we were in Paris, to take part in a march, it's called La Marche pour Jésus, the March for Christ. We would say, in the U.S., we would say the walk, the walk for Christ. Okay. But this is a huge event. Typically, 10 to 15,000 people take part in this in Paris. And it's not just in Paris, it's in how many cities, honey? It's all over Europe, right? Big. Yeah, big cities and towns all over France and other parts of Europe. And I'd never heard of it, but here we were, and there it was. And I said, well, let's go. And so in we went, and we, we, we went to the rendezvous point in the morning, on a, early on a Saturday morning. And we were going to march all through Paris. And it was exciting. Uh, there were four semi-trucks lined up on the, on the streets of Paris, each one about maybe a half block apart. And in between, you had crowds of people chanting, not, shouldn't say chanting, singing and praising the Lord and just very, having all kinds of fun. And there were families, kids, um, and all kinds of people, black, white, Latinos. We met a pastor from Bogota, Colombia, 
who was there was his church group. They had come to Paris. They had come to Paris to be missionaries. Okay? And so we're marching through the streets of Paris, having a grand old time. The music is, is fantastic. Uh, praise and worship songs. Each, each semi-truck had a band on board with the sides of the truck removed so that you could see the band uh, on, on each truck. And they were singing praise and worship and leading the rest of the crowd of us who were following in praise and worship. And we, would, we were going down and waving at the people in the windows. People would come out of their balconies and in the, the residential buildings, apartment buildings. They'd, they'd look down. Some would just look down and frown. And others would just, you know, wave back. And, and we had a great time. It, it, it even rained. We had brought a umbrella. We knew it was going to rain. It was supposed to be rain. But most of the time it was clear, and then sometimes it would, it would rain. And it was an interesting thing. We, it was very joyful, very powerful. I mean, I'd, I'd never done that before. You're walking in the streets, worshiping and praising the Lord and encouraging people. And, and they had guys uh, that were part of the organizers would go out on the sidewalks, and they'd hand out tracts to people. And they'd share the word with people. And people were just kind of wondering, what is going on here? And um, as we were going along, once, every once in a while, we'd see a police, uh, Parisian police officer come by on a uh, motorcycle, just calmly drive by. You know, they were providing security for the group. And they were fine. They were smiling. They were, everything was going well. And then at one point, after we had walked quite a long ways, We turned a corner, and we started seeing what we call in French the CRS. These are, you could almost say, they're like SWAT teams. They're like paramilitary police. These guys were not smiling. They were dressed all in black. They had helmets. They had, they had machine guns. They had their batons. And they were, they were on both sides of the street, in their trucks, their, in their um, personnel carriers. And they were standing outside just kind of looking at us. And I'd smile and wave at them, and they didn't smile back. And so I'm kind of wondering, well, what is going on here? Well, what was going on? We ended up in a huge one of the huge Parisian squares that's a, uh, a popular meeting place for large gatherings, demonstrations, and manifestations. And how many, how many of you have heard of Les Gilets Jaunes, the yellow vest, the yellow jacket protesters in Paris? It's been going on for like six, seven months. I don't know if it's still good. I think it's probably still going on. But every Saturday, they go out and protest. And it's unfortunate because it's a, uh, it's a group of people who have genuine concerns and they're out demonstrating. It was a peaceful group to begin with. And then what happened, the group got infiltrated by what we call in French les casseurs, the breakers. People who have no other purpose than to bring a bad image to the group. They infiltrate the group, and they start breaking stuff. They start smashing store windows. They start setting cars on fire, and they give the group a bad name because they dress just like everybody else. You can't tell them apart. And so now what was going on, this is, this is after several weeks of this stuff going on, they were protesting at the place where we were going to, Place de la République. So all of a sudden, we come up, and the truck stops. And we're kind of looking around, wondering what's going on. And on the other, we were caught basically, basically in between the two. On the left was a, was a large, large group of protesters, the Gilets Jaunes. They were not praising Jesus. They were not singing songs. They were protesting. And they were protesting loud. 
And on the other side, I could see the truck ahead of me, and on the other side, I could see a whole lineup of these CRS paramilitary guys. They had their shields out, they had their batons out, they had their face mask and gas masks on. And this did not look good. I say, oh my goodness, what is going on here? And all of a sudden, we started hearing loud bangs, bangs. And someone threw a tear gas grenade. And we got caught in it. It was our baptism of tear gas. It was not a happy time. We had basically had to turn tail and flee down this subway entrance that, thank God, was just you know, a few steps away, but people were rushing down that place trying to get out of that situation. It was not good. <laughs> it was not good. And uh, so, you know, what happened is the, the police forces started charging the protesters, throwing tear gas in, and we got caught in the middle of this. They weren't there for us. They were there for the Gilets Jaunes. And so what started as a peaceful, joyful, time of praising and worshiping ended up in tear gas, joy and tears. And that was, I'll tell you, when you think of Christians being persecuted, I started to get a, a little bit of a taste of what it might be like if one day we get in a situation where all of a sudden, the Christians are not good people. They're the people that have to be put down, silenced, and shut up. And if we're not careful in this country, we're going to slowly make it to that point. And I started to get a glimpse of, oh my gosh, this is what it's like to be repressed. Again, they weren't there for us, but it was, it was a... A strong message that, you know, we, Christianity is not necessarily lifted up everywhere we go. Another experience we had was <clears throat> going to, how many of you know Hillsong, the group, right? We all know Hillsong. Hillsong is a church in Australia. And Unknowns to me, they, had, uh, they have two or three campuses in France, church campuses, huh? in, in Paris, yeah. And um, so I, when I found out, I said, oh, wow, we got we to gotta go check it out. You know, I love Hillsong, love their singing, love their worship. So off we go one Sunday morning, we go to Hillsong. And... It was an experience, it, but see what happened is there were, the, the church took place in a theater, in a theater district of Paris. And the only way you could find out that there was a church there on Sunday mornings was if you went onto their website and you found out and you, you asked where somebody told you. There was no visible sign that we have church here on Sunday mornings. It was hidden behind theatrical decors and, and posters and things announcing theatrical pieces yet to come or currently playing. So we went in there, we had a grand time, just beautiful praise and worship as you might imagine. And the message the first time, I went there twice. It then was in Nice when I went the second time. The first time was, how many know Jerry Savelle? You've heard Jerry Savelle. I believe it's his daughter, Terry Savelle, that came and, and brought the word. And as she spoke in English and was translated into French at the same time. But the second time was an Australian pastor. And it happened to be on Father's Day. And he gave a beautiful sermon called like father like 
And it's basically, you know, you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. And how Jesus was a perfect example of sonhood, emulating everything his Father was doing. And again, took copious notes on that as well, and maybe I'll share that some, at some time. But the, the interesting point here is that here is a church that is basically hidden. It's almost a, like a secret church. If, if you don't know there's a church there, you could walk down the street and never guess. It's not publicized. Yet in the old churches of France, what do you see now? The old Catholic churches that have been abandoned, they're bought and turned into bars and restaurants. That's what's happened to the churches. And there are still, there are a few churches out there that are, you know, Catholic churches that are going on. But this is a trend. This is what's happening. Okay? Another spark. So France needs a lot of prayer. And I hope maybe we can get a chance to pray before the end of the evening. Another kind of spark that came to my mind was... Uh, the symbol here is, I call it, bitter hearts. And the, the lesson from this, well, let me explain what, what was going on. I was in a work group working with colleagues from the U.S. Embassy in Paris that I had known for 25 years since that's when I started. And most of them are still there. But something happened in the time, in the years past, that I was totally unaware of, but that God explained to me very clearly. Is one of, the, one of my colleagues, <clears throat> his name is Charles, had cancer. And he got treated. He went through treatment. And now Charles is a Mormon. Okay, devout Mormon, practicing Mormon, die-hard Mormon. And when he got healed completely from his cancer, he came out and made an announcement to all of my other colleagues and said, thank God I'm healed. The Lord God has healed me, which is great, right? But what had happened before is one of my other colleagues' wife had died of cancer. And this colleague, his name is Alain, did not take lightly to those comments. He was angry. And this had happened years ago. He would not, he told, he came and told me. He said, you know this child, you know what he did, you know, you know how he hurt me. <sighs> we have to be conscious. And it's just like you were saying, Alyssa, you don't shove people, you don't shove Jesus on people, right? And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying Charles was shoving religion into people, but it was probably fairly insensitive on his part to say that, knowing the other colleague's wife had just died from cancer. So Alain was like, he wanted nothing to do with religion, with Christianity, with any religion. He said, you guys are a bunch of phonies. You guys, you know, he was angry and bitter. And I thought, my goodness, what a, what, a, what a shame that someone with a heart for the Lord couldn't come to share 
his faith in a way that would have been more recept, you know, um, accepted, if you will. And the lesson from that is that you know we have to be careful. We have to be. It, we, yes, we have to be bold and 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 share our faith and not be ashamed of the gospel. That's not what I'm saying, okay? Don't, don't get me wrong. But I'm saying we have to be conscious it, of, of how we're sharing our faith and, and of how people who receive that message may receive it, okay? Because here now you have a very, very bitter heart, and it's going to take, take the Holy Spirit to break through that. I pray to God that happens for that man because he's very bitter. He's very angry. He's very dejected. He's very, um, he wants nothing to do with, with other people. And he, I could just see it in him. He's just very angry, very angry. And so how many people like that, you know, around us that, that we don't know? And another sort of not so bitter but lonely heart is my own sister my sister Josie in in Paris and the story here is really goes back to our childhood it goes back to the divorce of our parents that was never really worked through it was um, a thorn in most, in all of my siblings' sides, from my brother to me, who was the youngest at the time. And thank God, my brother and I came to know the Lord, and we've gotten over that. We've gotten over it. We forgave our father, and, and we moved on. And, you know, we can rejoice, we can be at peace, knowing the Lord. But my two sisters, Josie and Kathy, have never made that step. And I love my sisters, just like I love my brother. But I feel for them. I, I'm, I pray for them each day that I said, Lord, send someone to share the gospel, the light and your love into their hearts and lives. And um, so we met with Josie, and we met a couple of times, wonderful time together. But I see her loneliness. I see her hurt heart. You know, we have to be conscious of this, that um, even in our own families, people are hurting. And it's hard when you're the messenger in your own family, right? Anybody been there? It's hard. You so much want to share the peace and the joy that you have in the Lord with them. You so much want to give that to them. But they're not willing to receive it. And until the Holy Spirit does the work, uh, it's a tough battle. And... Uh, <laughs> So that's another spark, is that, hey, there's, when, when the Holy Spirit comes down, he's going to change the hearts, right? He's going to change lives in a big way. And um, the other thing I learned was perhaps not so spiritual, but it was a lesson in humility. One of the things that I was asked to work on uh, when I was in Paris Keep in mind, I'm working with colleagues who are, I'm, I'm part of the U.S. Embassy staff, okay? And one of the, the assignments was to write uh, what we call checklists, briefing checklists for the ambassador to France. And all of this consists of what her schedule is going to be, where she's going to be, when she's going to be there, who's going to meet her, who's going to greet her, the people she's going to meet, all of their bios, um, other important facts 
around that particular event. All of that has to be put down, black and white, paper, checked, double checked, triple checked, gone through approvals, gone through revisions, gone through edits, time and time and time again. It's a never ending work. Hours <laughs> spent putting this stuff together. And one of the parts of that assignment was to write remarks, the ambassador's remarks for twice, for uh, one morning reception, uh, an opening ceremony to the U.S. Pavilion at, at the air show, and then a second uh, event that evening at a reception. So here I am laboring and working my brain and trying to come up with interesting notes and anecdotes and facts and figures and putting all this on paper and you know polishing it up and using now that word doesn't quite get the meaning let's replace it and then someone would come along and scrap that paragraph talk about this so anyway the the day comes and the day comes when the ambassador arrives and she's going to be giving her remarks and I'm standing near the front and I'm just kind of closely observing what, oh, what she's gonna say oh, how is this the remarks going to come out and you know how is it gonna be received by the crowd and uh, she basically came up and made remarks that were totally off the cuff, off the cuff. And all that we had put together was like, <laughs> that was a lesson in humility, right? <laughs> because, it, you know, oh, here I am expecting that, you know, you, you, get, you get this feeling like it's, you know, you know, you're writing the president's speeches and, you know, famous words that someday will be captured and, you know, shared with, go on the news and all this. And it was a lesson in humility. And I was like, you know, you got to learn to, you got to learn to laugh at yourself. <laughs> There's no other way to, to go around that. So the, the Lord le taught me a lesson in humility there. That was, that was for sure. Um, to conclude, I wanted to talk about, you know, we, we basically what I've been sharing with you is a situation in a country, it happens to be France, but there are many Frances around the world. There's a France in, our, in the United States. There's probably many Frances in the United States. States where Christianity is shunned, mocked, made ridicule of, and this is increasing in our country, whether we know it or not. Just, you know, read the news, see what's going on. And so I wanted to share that with you because this is, to me, that's a call. It's a call to arms. It's a call to renew our faith, a call to be strong in our faith, to know who we are in Christ, to be bold about it, to be sensitive about it, and to be loving about it. With, as you always say, Pastor, you know, a, a, a love and a passion for people so that basically we're calling on the Holy Spirit to do the work. And I wanted to share something else with you that uh, I picked up from um, the Decision magazine that is put out by uh, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association that we get every month. Uh, it's called it's Decision. And in this issue, um, the, there's an article by Franklin Graham about what's going on in Venezuela. 
and he talks about how he went down to Colombia, where all the Venezuelans are, es are escaping to from Venezuela. They cross this bridge. They, they leave everything they have in their country. They bring only what they can carry, and their families, and they're, they're, they're going into the unknown. They don't know what's, what's waiting. There's nothing waiting for them necessarily in Colombia. They just want to be free. And the, the, the situation they're in currently in Venezuela is just not livable. So people are coming into Colombia hungry, thirsty, physically, yes, but spiritually, unbelievably so. And so Franklin Graham organized a, um, a festival, if you will. Uh, it's Franklin Graham Festivals. And, and he got together with the churches in the small town of Cucuta in Colombia, which is right across the border from Venezuela. And they had um, the usual, you know, they, they do music and praise and worship. And then Franklin Graham goes into his message. And he saw thousands of people, Venezuelans. This was specifically for the Venezuelan people, um, for their benefit. And he said people came by the hundreds to accept the Lord. They came forward to accept the Lord. And one of those that came up um, was a lady named Maria. Now, Maria is a church leader in Venezuela. She said that Venezuelan Christians are in a time where their faith is being tested. Before, she says, we preached about faith, we taught about faith, but now we're actually learning to live faith, she said. Those of us who have grown, who have stayed in Venezuela, have grown and learned that God is faithful. Maria herself has learned to trust God in all things. A few months ago, she had to have surgery, but most doctors in Venezuela no longer have access to important medical supplies. They don't even have surgical gloves. Yet she went ahead, went ahead with the surgery, knowing God was in control. So, again, that's another spark, another reminder of the importance for us to not just talk about faith, not just teach about faith, but it's time, brothers and sisters, for us to live our faith. And that means something different to each and every one of us here. But there's, we're coming to a time when we can no longer afford to sit back and let just ride along. Each one of us has a role to play. Each one of us has a stand to make. And I want to encourage you with that. I want to encourage you with the, with the fact that there's, there's people out there that need to hear your story. They need to hear your testimony. They need to hear what the Lord has done in your lives. So I want to encourage you with that. And uh, Pastor, if you want to pray perhaps uh, for those who don't know the Lord... Uh, I'm, I, I'm going to talk specifically, pray specifically about France tonight um, and perhaps there are others that have other similar requests.